folks. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to our tech talk uh, on the topic of artificial intelligence. And our goal in the, this program is to take an emerging technology topic you may have heard about in the news, uh, a lot of buzz around AI. And then we're going to ask some experts from the area uh, to tell us about it firsthand. So we'd like to ask them about their experience, their specialty, or what they think is important uh, for us to know about artificial intelligence. So uh, we're very grateful uh, to welcome tonight's panel. And uh, we have Dr. Emily Hand, Professor of Computer Science from the University of Nevada, Reno, and Director of the Machine Perception Laboratory. We have Quinn Corbulet, he is IT Manager uh, with Washoe County Regional Technology Services. Online, we have Bezad Zamanian. He's the Chief Information Officer for Washoe County. And we have Dr. Z Hamza, who is the Head of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning at Blockchains Inc. And we're gonna start off asking uh, each guest expert to speak for about five to 10 minutes on what they think is important for us to know or their area of expertise. And then we'll open it up to your questions for our expert panel here. So thank you everyone for being here. And we're gonna start off with Dr. Han. Yeah, um, hi, thanks for making it out. Um, and thanks to everybody online. Um, like you said, my name's Emily Hand. I'm a professor at UNR. Um, I'm in my sixth year there. And I teach machine learning and AI um, and computer vision and natural language processing. So that's like kind of word salad. Um, but basically what I do is AI applied to images and video and as well as language. So I run the machine perception lab. And what we do in there is we're trying to build wearable devices for people with social skills deficits, deficits or people who've lost their vision. Um, and so the idea is that we would have a wearable device in the end that would be able to provide feedback on a social interaction. So we're targeting specifically individuals on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, and we're hoping that these devices will be able to provide real-time social feedback, like understanding body language, facial expressions and emotion, as well as sarcasm and humor in actual language that could provide real feedback, real-time feedback to an individual so that their social interactions could be improved. Um, the idea would be obviously this wearable device for adults, but then also trainings for kids, because a lot of training for individuals with autism spectrum disorder starts when they're children and teaching them social niceties, basically. So a lot of that involves having access to trainings, which includes basically being a little bit well off. So if we can kind of reduce that barrier by allowing people to kind of interact with an app that can teach them those same things, um, that hopefully will increase access to these trainings and help individuals with social skills deficits improve their social interactions. So what do we actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? We work on all these individual problems. So we have projects trying to recognize emotions from faces and identify how someone is feeling and how an interaction might be going. Um, so we're collecting data right now for that, where we have two people sitting across the table from each other, asking each other kind of emotionally charged questions like, how's your relationship with your mother? And then people talk to each other about it. So we're collecting um, audio data as well as kind of like visual comfort and discomfort data. Um, and we're gonna use that to build a model that can then help someone understand those different intricacies of conversation. We also have systems to recognize and describe faces. And this is more specifically for people that have lost their vision. So um, the example that I think of, I have a friend who's in her mid thirties and she's losing her vision. Um, and so she'll never get to see her granddaughter or grandson when it's born. And so ideally the system would provide her with that kind of level of detail that a current system wouldn't be able to do. So you might be familiar with like face recognition at the airport or like your phone where it just says, yeah, you're you, right? What kind of detail is that? So someone that wants to know what their kids look like or what their grandkids look like want more unique facial details. And that's what we do in the lab is we recognize what makes you you, how would someone describe you if you were gonna go on a blind date, right? So that's what we do in my lab is we try to bring the human back into the machine learning and to the AI. So we use AI to solve human problems. Um, so that's kind of my expertise. I teach a lot of classes in that area and I'm just happy to kind of 
comment on anything, answer any questions today. But that's me in a nutshell. Thank you, Dr. Lynn. Next, we'll go to Bezad Zeminian. Bezad, tell us about yourself or what you do. Hi. Um... Yes, uh, I'm Bezat Zamani, and I'm the CIO um, with Washoe County. And um, you know, once every um, few decades, we come across uh, technologies that have a foundational impact, not only on how the business operates, but also it has um, impact, social impacts, and social and cultural impacts. And uh, with AI, AI is a good example of that. Um, some other technologies such as AI, I can call uh, the World Wide Web or the, the revolution, the, the cloud revolution. These type of technologies uh, do have a lot of impacts, not only on how we operate, how we work, how business processes work, but also it does have, as I mentioned, uh, social impacts. In Washoe County, we have about 32 departments. Um, so in a local government, in a county agency, um, it's unlike a the private sector, the core of business is very different from um, one department to another. We have the sheriff's office that their focus is public safety. So the type of applications that they use is very different than our finance department that uses financial systems. So um, working in an IT environment uh, of a county feels like working for 20 or 30 different uh, businesses that have very different um, goals and objectives. And because of that, uh, we have to deal with a lot of different types of systems. And uh, as you can imagine, the use of AI could be very valuable for automation of a lot of our business processes from our um, health district to our um, public safety sheriff's office, um, law enforcement, and so on. So what we are doing at the county is, um, we are trying to kind of um, make sure that um, these type of technologies uh, are only successful if they do, um, they do have a top-down approach in adoption of the technology, meaning that we need uh, the complete support from the top of the organization, uh, complete support and initi initiating of the projects at the top of the organization so that it's successful. Uh, so what we've done is we are working on a series of workshops, working with the executive team to kind of define a strategy on, okay, what, what are the risks? What are the, what is the vision? What is the risk? What is the uh, values and um, adoption methodologies that we should be using so that um, we don't encounter um, um, risks that could potentially um, have a negative impact, not only on the adoption of this technology, but also um, you know, getting the name of the county on the papers and so forth. So um, our focus right now is kind of building that strategy, that framework so that um, AI projects are, they go through a very structured methodology for adoption and um, to make sure they're, they're successful. We are working on a series of projects such as um, implementation of an AI chatbot um, so that um, you know, citizens, when they go on our website, they can ask a question. And instead of getting routed to a web page, so you have to read, you know, this huge document to find out a specific piece of information, you can ask it a question. Right now, we are uh, testing our business license process, where instead of you having to, to deal with the documents on our website, you can ask it a question such as, how much does it cost me to get a business license for a community event and it tells you 375 instead of having you to go through the whole document and trying to, to figure that out. So um, again, we have projects of that nature that are citizens facing as well as um, some um, um, language translation type of AI applications that we are implementing. Uh, we, we are working on a total of about uh, five projects right now for different areas. Um, we are at a point in time that we, we are deciding do we want to focus on productivity tools uh, with the use of AI, or we want to kind of look at the citizens facing um, type of applications, which has a lot more risks associated with it. Uh, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Benzad. Quinn, please take it away next. Sure. Uh, I'm Jim Perdue, uh, 
I am a person who is there for the Office of Immigration Services, and I manage the regional services for the uh, So based on my today are kind of tag teaming. Um, so he hit on several of the points that I that I am going to talk about here. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, in a former life, I was a geographer. Uh, I worked on geographic information systems and worked at DRI, Desert, the Desert Research Institute, applying uh, what today would be called machine learning techniques for um, pulling out objects in imagery. So in other words, you see a aerial imagery of a city and we worked on pulling out the objects. So like the trees or the buildings or cars. And so identifying exactly what those uh, objects are in the image really helps uh, for some certain levels of analysis. Um, so going back to Washington County uh, and, and expanding on what Bezog was saying, we're really trying to build some guardrails and some policy for use of artificial intelligence um, around data governance, because data is really kind of the, 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 the feed line for how artificial intelligence or data science or machine learning, it, it, those techniques really need a good uh, set of base data. So putting some governance around how we manage our data, how we share our data between departments, um, the data, who owns the data, um, who maintains the data. So those types of things within a county government is really important so that we have a baseline data set rather than data silos. So we can all share our data and understand the data that we have. Um, I'm gonna check my notes here. So again, going back to mitigating risk, we wanna ensure privacy. So if we're sharing data, so I, I think, you know, we, we're all pretty familiar with ChatGPT, for example. So if we're putting in a prompt to chat ChatGPT, we want to make sure that we're not sharing private information. So let personally PII, personally identifying information, from criminal justice information, health information. We want to make sure that those boundaries are in place for the county so that we're not sharing that data with uh, a, a company that may use that data for something else that we don't want them to. Um, making sure the data is secure, secure, making sure that the AI models that we're using are not biased. Um, so they're not trained on data that ha already has a bias and then return bias, biased information back to us that we would maybe rely on to make decisions. Um, overall, we, we really wanna make sure at the county that we're using AI to enhance our services to the public. Um, to, in, to advance social good. Um, and another part here, we wanna keep our vendors accountable. So right now, every vendor is waving their arms and saying, we have an AI tool, buy our products. So we need to make sure that they are accountable in terms of what they're selling to us, but also that they're keep, keeping our data private. Um, so there, there are a lot of things that we're kind of just developing right now at the county to keep vendors accountable in, in terms of the products that, they, that they're selling and the products that we're using. Um, internally at the county, I think there, there's been a lot of discussion around, well, AI is gonna take my job. I'm gonna lose my job because of this wonderful new technology. And we don't see that happen, happening necessarily. Um, we think that it can be a wonderful tool that I can and really improve our efficiency, that we can enable some staff who do mundane tasks to do higher level tasks, to, make, to, to, to go and do the more complicated tasks that now AI can do um, for us, right? So um, yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of the end of what I wanted to start with here. I'm happy to talk more about this. I think this is a really good discussion. Thank you. And next, Dr. Hamza. Hey, good evening, everybody. Um, the introduction, I'm Z Hamza. I'm the director, uh, the head of AI machine learning at, uh, at Blockchains. And so in addition to 
uh, being hands-on with the code and part of innovation at, at blockchains. Um, I also work kind of at the intersection of a lot of what Quinn was just talking about, actually. Um, risk mitigation, uh, how do we build AI in a way that protects data privacy? Uh, how do we innovate ethically? Um, and then I also do a lot of work in thought partnership around affecting policy. So promoting legislation that doesn't stifle creativity or uh, risk uh, protecting intellectual property, um, but, but really work with the government to regulate real existing issues uh, that we, we currently see in um, the rise of, of generative AI technology. So some, again, of the things that Quinn just talked about, uh, disinformation, uh, copyright bias, uh, racial bias, uh, classism and awareness that even as uh, more and more uh, of these tools are available uh, every day that that there are still people without uh, access to the internet uh, in different communities across the country. Uh, the environmental impact of compute costs, it takes a lot of um, computing machines to, to train all of these large language models and those have a, a real um, environmental impact. Um, and then also just industry specific risk mitigation. So it's one thing uh, for me to get on ChatGPT and ask for a recipe or instructions on how to cook something or help my 13 year old with his homework. But it's something completely different when we're using this generative technology um, in medical affairs to make medical decisions, legal decisions, political decisions. And so looking at how we mitigate risk in those areas um, and then I also um, testified before the, the US Congress on technology privacy in the law, as well as um, work with parliament in the UK on the new EU law that, that they just crafted. And so um, I think I try and sit somewhere between um, what is a, a lofty and worthy goal of how do we take these tools and make them generally available in a way that actually does benefit humanity uh, because they're capable of really incredible things. Uh, but how do we also make sure that we're we're addressing issues that that we currently see uh, that that exist in in generative AI right now that that have real impacts? Um, uh, things like disinformation as we get ready to to head into um, election season, uh, things like, racial bias that shows up when um, when we don't use quality data to, to train these systems. Uh, and those have impacts um, when it comes to financial decisions like uh, career, uh, you know, credit lending um, and, and, and also have um, impacts on education uh, and, and the tools that certain populations have available to them uh, that, that others may not. So uh, I think I think that might be a little bit of the overview and also happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Dr. Hobza. Um, so kind of turn it over to questions from the audience, but could we start with taking a step back and could, could someone jump in and tell us a little bit about what actually is artificial intelligence? What is behind that term? So you hear it all the time in the news articles everywhere, um, but what, what really makes it work? And you could use that as an example, what is chat GPT? And you talk about training an AI or a model. How do you train AI? Would anyone like to start us at the beginning? I guess I could dive in. I guess I'm the teacher. I guess it's my responsibility. Yes, are, yes. Yes. <laughs> so I was ill prepared to give a lecture. So roll with me if you can. Um, but AI as a general term, so when you hear machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, all this deep learning, all that stuff, it all exists under this AI umbrella. So AI is the greater term around that. And even statistics and things like that fall underneath AI. All AI is, it's really not that frightening. All it is, is for the most part, it's just math. But what it really is, artificial intelligence is this idea that a computer can find patterns on its own. And so I use air quotes because it's not exactly doing it all by itself. We write a program 
that allows it to do that. And so basically, instead of me identifying a pattern, right, instead of me looking at an image of a dog and an image of a cat and saying, dogs look like this, and I'm going to write a whole long list of what dogs look like, and then I'm going to write a whole long list of what cats look like. Instead of doing that and telling the computer, look for this long list of things when you're looking for dogs and look for this long list of things when you're looking for cats. What AI does, basically a lot of these deep learning systems, you can give it both the images of cats and the images of dogs, and it will use math, like calculus, linear algebra stuff, and it'll look at the image and it'll find little patterns and it'll say, these little patterns are associated with dogs and these little patterns are associated with cats. So now I don't have to tell it explicitly what is a cat and what is a dog, it can figure it out. All I have to do is say, this is a picture of a cat. This is a picture of a dog. Now you tell me how you tell them apart. And it can do that, it's just math, it's glorified math. But this idea of training models and the data that you need to train so if I collect a bunch of images of cats and dogs, for example, we're gonna run with this cat dog example. <laughs> if I collect a bunch of images of cats and dogs and I say, I want a model, an AI model that's gonna take an image of something and it's gonna tell me if it's a cat or a dog. So I collect a bunch of images of cats and a bunch of images of dogs and then it learns patterns to try to discriminate between the two things. And so if I only give it pictures of white dogs, and I only give it pictures of red cats. And then I train my model and it says, I can tell the difference between dogs and cats. And then I give it a new image of a red chow. It's gonna say, that's a cat. <laughs> because the data I gave it was red versus white, not dog versus cat. So when you're collecting data to train your algorithms, you have to give it diverse data. So I wanna make sure all dogs are represented or all types of dogs are a wide variety of dogs as well as a wide variety of cats, right? If I gave it a hairless cat, it would be like, what? <laughs> I've never seen anything like that before, right? So you have to make sure your data is diverse. And so this comes into play when you talk about face recognition systems, you need to make sure the people that you use to train these systems are diverse so that they can handle diverse people. Does that make sense? Sorry, I was just, that was just like an off the cuff. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? What's the difference in the background files when you compare text data and images? Is there something like really principally different? Or it's the same just working with the areas? And excuse me, I'm just going to repeat that for the online folks, but it was. Uh, what is the difference in the math behind uh, the data you're feeding the model between text and image? I'm going to just dive in. You guys don't know me, but I'll just go if you don't stop me. So feel free to just jump in instead. I'm so sorry. So there's only one real main difference. Um, the, the difference is that when you have an image, an image is just a matrix of numbers. So when you actually look at a pixel, it's three numbers. It's a red number, a green number, and a blue number. And those numbers combine into the color that you see on the pixel. And so what you're dealing with when you have an image is literally just a 2D array of numbers. And so the computer knows what to do with that. The computer doesn't because the computer loves numbers. <laughs> um, when you give it a sentence, like the dog jumped over the fence, that's not numbers, right? So you have to actually take the language data and convert it to numbers in some way. And typically you do that in a bunch of different ways, but one way to do that is what's called a bag of words. And so you'll like, you'll take a news article and you'll find all the unique words and you'll create a vocabulary that's your vector and you'll count. How many times did I see the word the? 25 times. How many times did I see the word Trump? 10 times. How many times did I see the word Biden? 15 times, whatever. So I'm, it was a political news article. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? And then you use that vector as input, but so essentially it's the same. Is, is the, the number that you feed it the, the amount of times that you saw the word the, or is, it, is there a number associated with each word or a number associated with each letter? So that's a great question. So each word exists in this vector. So like the has the first location in the vector. 
Trump, in my terrible example, sorry, what Trump has the second location in the vector and Biden has the third location. So the each vector, each element of the vector is how many times you saw that. So the has, I don't remember what I said, 20 instances in this article, Trump has 10 and Biden has 15. And so you just have the counts in the vector. So the vector would be 20, 10, 15, and then all the other words. Um, and so that's how you, you feed that vector then into the same algorithms that you would use for computer vision. So in the end, that answer your question. Okay. Require more memory or more data storage. And the question was, uh, which of these methods require more memory or data storage? They're both a lot. <laughs> yeah. they're, I can both, jump in a little yeah. bit here. Uh, oh, sorry. So um, really similar to, to what the professor was saying, I would also say for, for anyone in the audience that remembers back to uh, maybe 10th or 11th grade English class and remembers what it looks like to diagram a sentence and, and to take different um, parts of speech and, and separate them out diagramming a sentence. So um, I can't speak as much to the computer vision components, but as far as the, the large language models are concerned, kind of think about diagramming that sentence structure and then using um, different distance measuring algorithms with these vectors. So Euclidean or Levenstein. And so not only are we taking what's called PFIDF and counting how many different times certain words appear, um, but we're also um, looking at the distance between those words and then using that for um, predictive text, predicting a next word. And so if you think about when you are maybe typing an address into Google or Apple Maps um, and you type half the address and the rest of it shows up in a search box or you're Googling something in particular and you start typing and all of a sudden the, the rest of what it is that you wanted to type appears, it's kind of that predictive text. And so what these large language models using those vector systems and Euclidean are able to do is by, by going through such a large corpus of data. I mean, millions and millions of um, of, of of, of different words, actually billions of parameters, it's able to just figure certain things out about language. So when you're signing off of an email, um, it, it knows to maybe say, thank you, comma, or sincerely, comma, when you um, are starting an email and you type good and your first letter is in, it maybe knows that what you're wanting to say is morning. And so Chat GPC and the rest of these large language models then aren't actually understanding um, what it is that you're saying or or have an understanding of um, the output, but but are able on a, a, a massively large scale to handle this pattern recognition um, and be able to then match words appropriately together uh, to make estimations about what it is that you're feeding them and, and outputting. And I guess just to tack on to the end of that, in terms of whether or not large language models or computer vision models um, re require more compute size, I would say uh, with the exception of really large models like those at OpenAI, so ChatGPT or uh, Gemini, uh, which is one of Google's newest models, um, aside from those massive LLMs, computer vision uh, actually takes the cake in compute time and, and storage because of the density of all of the, the pixelation and uh, the data set that you're having to feed it to do the training. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, if uh, chat GPT makes a mistake at a fundamental level, such as mistaking a red cow for a cat, and people start going to chat GPT for their information, what to prevent that from being a runaway error that is reaffirmed enough times that the correction patterns uh, don't match up with the number of times people see this mistake and repeat it? So that's a that's a great question, and also just sort of a fundamental question of like where are we going with AI, and is it something to be afraid of? Right. So um, that is basically, I would say, one of my biggest concerns with AI, in that it's kind of permeated everything and it now can generate realistic images and realistic photos and things like that. So a little less in this idea of it'll generate a red cow and then everyone will think a red cow is now a cat. Hopefully there's enough human history that we won't wash that out and not know what a cat is within you know any reasonable time frame. But there is this idea that these systems can generate realistic video, realistic images, realistic news articles 
that haven't been written by a real person. Um, and so there's this idea of like, when, when does all this fake stuff actually become real and how are we supposed to tell the difference? Um, currently, there are people who are fighting the good fight, which is they're building their own models that can tell you whether or not something is fake. Um, and so you can, you know, generate something with chat GPT and then run it through one of these models and it'll say, yeah, chat GPT wrote that a person didn't write that. Um, and that's fine, but these models will eventually get good enough to trick these other models um, because that's the way that they're actually trained. Um, so it's really a good question. It's, it's more, I think, I think people get really excited and they use these tools um, kind of to do whatever they can because it's fun but then it kind of trickles down into actual business and people use it as it's intended, which is as a tool to improve productivity. And so I, I'm not that concerned in the long run, but that is, I think one of the major concerns is how are we gonna tell what's fake and what's real down the line? Yeah, what about the social implications that now we can't really have confidence that what we see is human generated and accurate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, anyone is welcome to speak on this, but um, I, I agree. Yeah. It's a, I think it's a challenge. I think, I think we have to more than ever teach kids and people to be critical thinkers. And just because something's on the news doesn't mean, and not just like the news that we watch, but like the news that we read, just because it's on there doesn't mean that it's reputable. Right. So it's like more about finding reputable places that, explicitly tell you how they use AI, if they are using AI and that kind of thing. And so just really thinking about these things critically and coming with, you know, the mindset of just because I saw it doesn't mean it's real because seeing used to be believing, right? But now you're seeing everything through a computer screen. And so now you think everything that you see on the computer screen is real and that's not true. So I, I like to say skepticism. <laughs> But I, somebody else should definitely. If somebody sees something that's flat out wrong, mm -hmm. demonstrably, you can find documentation, you can mm -hmm. prove it easily. Uh, what's the procedure to introduce this? To, you mean um, to, to get the correction? Into to the, get corrections. Oh, so I mean, uh, so that's a great question. Um, so, in terms of journalism, that's definitely not something that I could speak on directly. Um, but I would say it'd be a very similar process to what it is now, which is identifying the mistake, coming up with the proof and submitting it to editors and things like that. Because if it's a reputable place, they don't want those kinds of things and they will submit a correction. If it's not a reputable place, they're not going to take your complaint seriously and you know that you shouldn't be reading that venue, right? Um, but I would imagine it would be the same process as it is now when someone makes a mistake in a news article or generates something. Yeah, and I would say that the, many of the reputable sources for AI technology, they have a way to submit. It, okay, we found that the, the, the AI returned a mistake or the wrong answer. I mean, you can always say to the AI, AI hey, that's wrong, and it will try to correct itself. But you can also, there's also always ways to submit. You know, I added this prompt and it returned a, an incorrect answer. And then, so you guys should know about it. And so they can work on correcting. But I mean, I, I think the, the, the question or the concern is more about the, the bad actors who are going to be out there and going to use this technology to produce videos mm -hmm. or images or voice technology. I mean, we've mm -hmm. heard about uh, robocalls um, mm -hmm. and that's really a challenge. And I, I, I yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to tackle. With the deep base that nobody can even spot, mm -hmm. um, just how do we as a society function when we can no longer rely on our media? When you have to automatically uh, exert skepticism towards anything that comes from your computer screen. Well, and I, so I think reputable sources, if they use AI, they sh should, and this is something this is, we talked about policy at Washington County, we're part of our policy is if you use AI to produce a, uh, like let's say a staff report to our board of county commissioners, you need to write at the bottom. This, to some of this text was reproduced by ChatGPT or Copilot and edited by the author or something like that. So reputable sources should say, just like mm -hmm. Emily alluded to, they should say this video was generated by, by somebody else. Um, when they do not do that, that's when I think 
you should have skepticism. Uh, sir, you have a question, then we'll go to Margaret. Please go ahead, sir. Um, I, I'm interested how you have the opportunity to talk about uh, the convergence of uh, source of information, government information, not sure how these are exactly right set up here, and commercial entities that maintain that information into an AI platform. So if we text, take ChatGPT, for example, and, and ask it many questions about very specific information that Washoe County today publishes, right? You may find that ChatGPT says, I am, I've done this. I have no information about it. So you've kind of gotten to the limit of where it can train, right? As a result of what you've asked. It doesn't know, right? It didn't look at that report, so it can't tell you the response, right? So my question here is, when I think of our government at most local level, um, like Washington County or India here in town, or the federal government for that matter, I'm concerned that they stop producing these reports that were fundamentally so dependent upon because they're concerned about how they're used and leave it to the commercial entities of the world, right? Keep publishing. Do not stop audit reports, which are the source of what AI means. Without the source of the most specific information that we publish at the governmental level, um, those AI systems are ignorant, right? So when I hear our government, our Washoe County wants to get involved in AI, I'm like, uh, I'd much rather have you observe it, keep publishing what you do, and let commercial entities suck up that information because if you look at the roadmap from NVIDIA right now, published by the face of Jennifer Jensen Wall, their CEO, you're gonna find that the, the technology is advancing so quickly that we as citizens or and or government need to continue to produce the right information, right? And I'm just concerned on, and, and what I'd like to hear is as government entities, whether it's Washington County, CIO, how do you feel about continuing to publish? And these AI engines are gonna ingest them, right? And they're gonna produce answers to questions that you don't control as opposed to the government now absorbs the responsibility of creating its own AI platform where we, the citizens, don't get to see the raw reports anymore. We just get to see the results of ChatGPT. I have no idea how it was trained, right? I didn't study how ChatGPT was trained. So I tested it with Washoe County specific information and I found the limit. I'm concerned that with the wrong direction, the wrong leadership, our government agencies take the wrong approach, which is they try to absorb the responsibility of building an AI platform around their data, as opposed to just keep publishing, audit results, how do we spend the taxpayer's money, here's what we got in invoices, here's how we spent them. So what, given what you do, Quinn, and what others do at WASHA, how do you feel about just opposing those two positions? Right, me as a commercial guy, I'm a private citizen. I'd like to see private entities take government data and use it effectively through AI tools, as opposed to the government is going to now take on the responsibility of taking their own information and building an AI platform to tell us what that information is. And that scares me. And just to repeat it for the folks online, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're concerned about uh, how government is going to use its own information. Is it going to use it through AI or uh, as, as it has been in the past, they will produce reports and share data and then private entities can, can use it. Media, uh, they, third party organizations, you know, that's, that's universal, right? So how does how do people feel about that? So I, I, don't, I don't know if Faisad wants to jump in. I have an answer. I have a, at least partial answer. So first, when you asked ChatGPT about Washington County, ChatGPT is trained up until 2021. Yeah. Right. So, so there, there may be there's a gap. Yeah, I'm trying to tell you a couple. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Right. So, so that that's where you you may have seen that, but yeah. uh, we are required to publish all you know. So public uh, public meetings we're required to publish minutes sure. and video. We're required to publish all of our budgets and all, a lot. Any decision that happens at the level. 
we're required to publish that in English. Yeah, we, we will continue to do that. Um, on the AI side, we are we are trying to create our own, and Bezad mentioned this earlier, we're trying to create our own chatbot. The idea is that we can provide better service to, to citizens of Washoe County by answering the easy questions. So, and, and the one thing we're doing right now is for business licensing. So if somebody comes to, and with this, we haven't published this, but we're working on it. Um, so if somebody comes to the Washington County website and they want to know about how to apply for a business license, they can use the, 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 the basically our, our, our version of ChatGPT to say, how do I apply for a business license? And right now, the way we've trained it, we've trained the model so that it has only the information about business licensing. We want to expand that so that you can come and say, how do I get a birth certificate or a death certificate? Or how do I um, change my, my, my land zoning? Um, so those types of things, those are kind of the first step. That, the, the, we get a lot of phone calls, we get a, uh, and that prevents people from making, actually walking into Walker County and having to interact with it, which is, I'm not trying to discourage this in any way, but you know, it makes, it surfaces that information and makes it easier to access as opposed to someone spending hours on a website digging into all the PDF files, et cetera. So our, our goal is really to improve service um, and to provide easier access to information through these tools as opposed to ob obscuring anything. Um, and again, like, like I said, we're required to publish all this information, whether it goes into an AI or not, the information will be there. Um, and that's, in fact, that's another initiative that the county is to improve transparency to make data and for information more accessible to citizens. Because, you know, honestly, it's not as easy to get to as it should be. I think a lot of the confusion here is there's a lot of confusion as a lot of people call it both RAG and fine tuning training. So it, um, I think that's. So what's going on? So I assume, are you going to fine tune a model for the county or are you planning on using RAG? Question, are, are, is Washoe County planning on fine tuning a model or using RAG and what is RAG? Uh, let's see what this stands for. Something augmented generation. Retrieval, Retrieval augmented generation. generation. Yes. Thank you. So, and I think Bezad's ready to respond. Let me jump in uh, before I get to, to the second question, go back to what Quinn was talking about in terms of um, uh, services, additional services that we are trying to provide. One thing we are trying to do is to add additional services instead of replacing any of our existing um, services that we, we provide. For example, if we are going to have a chatbot to answer questions to the citizens, we are not replacing our website. Our website is always going to be there. In the same fashion, if we are looking at generating AI type of um, dashboards and um, reporting, we are not going to eliminate any of our um, financial reports and existing systems and services that we have. That's one way to look at it. But uh, the, other, the other thing that I wanted to kind of also bring up was that one of the reasons that we are trying hard to build a strategy, building a, build, a, build a structure around uh, the use of AI at the county is exactly the risks associated with the AI. Um, AI, um, if it's not trained properly, if, if the information provided is not accurate enough, uh, can, be, uh, can provide wrong information, wrong data. So because of that, we are trying to build not only a policy and procedure around the use of AI, but also we want to kind of make sure that we pilot every AI applications first, make sure that it works as it was intended. And um, it, it, is, it, is, it adds to our productivity more than anything else. Um, but going to the second question, um, as it relates to the, how we are trying to build our um, chatbot and, and, and the model that we are working on, what we are doing at this point is not we are not genera generating a new language model rather than Doing that, we are using the existing large language models that is available there, but we are providing content that is more accurate to these language models so that the responses that comes out of the language model is based on 
very specific and accurate data that was provided. And one of the risks associated with AI is exactly that. If your data is not accurate enough and if it has issues. So no, we are not creating a new language model. Uh, we are not creating a small language model. Rather, we are using the existing large language models that are there, but we are training the language model with the specific data and documents that we have in the organization. An example of it is um, our business license um, project. We have 200 documents, PDF documents, that they have specific instructions as to how you apply for business license, what are the costs of getting different types of business licenses, and what, what is the procedure? So these 200 documents, we, we feed that information into AI. Not only we have to then test every single scenario and ask it questions, make sure pilot it to make sure that the, the responses are accurate. And then once we feel that we are getting a good 90 to 95% accuracy rate, then we make it available. But um, again, the, the important thing to note is that we are not going to work on AI projects in a, in a, in a large project. Rather, we, we are going to pilot it, make sure that it functions. And one thing that we have learned so far is that it takes a lot of work um, using this AI um, tools out there. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the, the amount of testing and quality control that it, that it requires. Uh, to give you an idea of rolling out a chatbot for one simple business license function in the county, it has taken us about six months of testing and we are not there yet. So it does take a lot of quality control in, or, in order to make sure that it's successful. Can I interrupt this? And this is the, the core of my question. Uh, what what the dip like you mentioned, sir? That it's about the, the quality of the incoming information. I'm a technologist and been involved in building systems my whole life. And you mentioned this data comes from our government, and and we know that the quality of the information is the underlying concern. And if it comes from our government agency, call it the county, the city, the federal government, where does the role of that government stop, and this AI? endeavor begin because my concern is at the end of the day, our governments are responsible for the accuracy of the data that goes into any of our AI systems. I can build an AI platform using open AI and, and what, what Elon Musk just gave to the world, a terabyte of information, go look it up, download it, right? Grow. And, and, and we can build our own on the published information from our governments today, but it's worthless if it's not accurate. And I hear in this discussion, you know, this where does that end? Where's the government's responsibility end with respect to this? And personally, I hope it's at the border of accurate information. Because I can't go audit the government. I can't go audit Washoe County. I have to trust that whatever you publish is accurate for what I build as an AI platform, right? Because anybody can take what you publish is publicly available information and put it into the system. So I would much rather have our governments focus on accurate information instead of playing with AI tools that they'll never catch up. I'm a semiconductor guy. I know what we're doing at six nanometer technology to build AI chips, right? And our government responds. It doesn't in, in, innovate. So where, does, where do you serve, you know, where do you believe the, the boundary is, and even at the university level, where is where does government end and we pick up the rest of the world? And mm -hmm. I'm concerned if I ask the, our, whatever agency, federal on down, to split their precious resources, now take on AI and hopefully not compromise the the, the integrity of the data that they produce today, because they're going to go and take on AI. I'd much rather than focus on yeah, we'll get the rest. Leave it to us. Right? Question is, is, is there a problem? That's the issue. Where do where does government end and AI begin, and how do you ensure the accuracy of the data? If your job is responsibility as the CIO of Washoe County, I would hope that we're getting accurate information because the rest of us can now produce any kind of AI system with that, whether it's a chatbot to interact with consumers or anything else, 
But if the underlying information that's going into audit results, budget information, anything else that's produced by our government that's really important, where does that end? Why does the government have to do anything with AI? Just keep producing reports that are accurate. Bezad, would you like to speak to that? And then Ms. Martin, sure. next. Sure. Um, the way we look at AI, AI is yet another tool. Uh, we are not looking at AI, but anything than uh, and, and another technology, another tool that can help us become more productive. Um, I don't think that, and in fact, um, in my experience, in 30 years of experience in technology in this field, um, I think that a lot of times new technologies enforce enforce some level of integrity in our data in that they enforce some level of quality control, making sure that the data that is provided is accurate. And um, I've seen in, in, in a number of projects when we implemented a, a, new, a new system, we, we, we figured out that the, the data that was going in was causing issues as part of the reporting process. I think with AI, we are also seeing the same type of thing. One example was that, um, going back to the same uh, example of the business license chatbot. As part of this quality assurance testing process that we are going through, we have learned that a lot of our information on our website, they, they, they were not up to date. So we had to pull all of that, make sure that we go through the experts and make sure that that information is updated before it's fed into AI, right? But again, um, I, don't, I don't see AI as, um, I don't think that um, governments should stop in terms of quality control on the data and let AI begin to, to function in terms of doing the, that type of work for, for government. Rather, I see AI as a tool, as a, as a tool to um, enhance and make, our, um, make, make us more productive than anything else. And again, in some sense, it is enforcing some level of integrity in our data control, data quality control. Thank you. Margaret. Well, my question is, is the quality of the data, the accuracy of the data, who's entering the data, what their qualifications are, and you know nothing of that uh, if someone's coming in and asking questions. You know, how do I trust what you've put in is accurate, or is that your perception of accuracy? And in dealing with the government, the perception of integrity and quality and accuracy is beyond, it's questionable at best. And so as just a person, and I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to need some information and I'm going to go um, to somebody that uses AI. There is no way in hell I would ever trust that that information would be accurate any more so than that particular person entering into a website or putting the financials on a website where I can see the numbers and stuff, I have no idea if those numbers on a financial are accurate. And with AI, there is no way of proving the accuracy, the integrity, the honesty of the input when you're relying on agencies, number one. And so it's it's not even a valid source of anything when the initial data input is not provable and it's not maybe reliable and it's um, it's not, we could take 10 persons in a room and we would all have a different opinion on something. So do you put the 10 opinions in and then let AI scramble it to maybe come up with one opinion that's going to be published? It just doesn't make sense. So the question is, how do we trust the data that or the answers that are given to us by an AI? For example, chat GPT, we don't know what the where they are, where the information is coming from, what the references are. You don't know how to prove it. And how do we ensure the accuracy of data specific to government? Yeah. So, so I would I would I want to jump in here on that. Um, so and this kind of trying to answer a couple of questions here at once. We're not creating our own AI. We're utilizing a tool that already exists 
and basically providing it the most accurate information that we can and making sure through testing that it provides answers back that are accurate. So uh, Bezad mentioned 90, 95% accuracy. That's a really high level of accuracy for uh, a generative AI tool. Can you um, give us a little background? So you're training a tool with wash up specific information. Yeah, so and so information so can you that- share, what, what is that? What, what do you mean? What is it to train the tool with wash up specific Okay, so, so that it can answer questions correctly? So there's an existing large language models, like, sure. so like ChatGPT. We're not using ChatGPT, we're using Microsoft's Copilot um, or Microsoft's Azure services. And they ha basically have a service where we can feed it information and it, it learns that information. And then basically we have said, limit your answers to only the information that we have provided. So when, and, and Bezad, and this is something data integrity is a really big important question here. And that's something that we're also trying to wrangle. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we at the county have a ton of different data, 30 different departments all collecting their own data in their own ways. And so wrangling all that data in, in a way that allows, and I, and we're not committing to using AI for everything. We want to provide better services. That's the goal here. So if, and we're not, let's say we're not going to put in financial reports into uh, ChatGPT and have it spit out answers about our finances necessarily. Um, we're providing very basic information to the AI so that it can provide very basic answers. So people, a lot of times people come to the, to the county and ask, how do I, uh, get a business license or so those are like very simple things that we can relieve staff of having to do so we can become more efficient in the things that we do and focus more on the more challenging tasks that humans need to do rather than doing the mundane tasks um, from an accuracy standpoint again it, it is really important that we put in accurate data so who does that and it's again, it's a variety across the county. We have many, many different departments. We have many, many different data analysts and people who are doing their day to day work. We have different systems. Like, I don't know if you, if anybody has, has interacted with a Sela or one Washell, I think it's called. Um, if you're going to uh, apply for a building permit, um, so that is a system that you can. Uh, uh, digitally apply for a building permit. It goes, everything goes into a database in the back end, and then we can use that data. We're not using the data now for any anything having to do with AI, but so we can use that data eventually to help us make better decisions. And I think ultimately in the long run, that's where we want to get is to be able to utilize any of the data that we collect, making sure that it's accurate, making sure that we have processes and validation that makes sh to make sure that all the data that we have in our systems is accurate. And then using that data to ultimately become more efficient and make better decisions. Because I mean, you, you mentioned private entities outside of government. That's what's ha what, what happens in, in private business. Private businesses use the data that they have to make better decisions so that they can be more efficient and ultimately make more money, right? So we want to be more efficient so that we don't have to raise taxes or so that we don't have to increase our staff. Um, so those are the types of things that we are looking at in terms of utilizing these tools to become more efficient across our government. Let me so quickly sorry. jump in, if I may, Please, jump in yes. quickly. Um, I want to first uh, thank and thank you know the question that that came up. The past couple of questions are very valuable, and my takeaway from the past couple of questions is that citizens would like to see some level of um, perhaps verification, and if what the, what the chatbot is providing is accurate, one thing that I that we are looking at is potentially creating a link to the original document. So not only that the chatbot can basically respond back to you and answer your question, but also gives you a link to the actual original document. My question for the group is that if some, would something like that help in terms of trusting the source of data? 
chat GPT does that. Yeah, it provides it. it has yeah. some source reference yeah. on virtually yeah. any thing, it'll provide that. Well, and, and what, what, what Bezat is saying, actually, our bot, our, our chat agent does that now. So it says, it gives you an answer on how to apply for a business permit and then links to the document that has the that's same right. information. So that's really, really important so that you can see the connection between what the, the AI produced and the actual information that we produce, that we publish on our website. Let's go to uh, one of the questions in the chat here. And Dr. Hamza, maybe you can speak to this. Uh, what is blockchain and are there ways that blockchain technology can improve trust of first party data? So at the origin of the data that can then be used in large language models like ChatGPT. Yeah, sure, that's a great question. Um, so blockchain technology, most simply put, is, is a way of linking things together in a, a ledger uh, type fashion that make the lineage of that chain immutable. Um, so there's provenance and, and a way to verify um, that uh, wh whatever it is that, that is being tracked on the blockchain hasn't changed. Um, so if, if you think about links of a chain uh, that, that are all connected, if you were to remove one link from the middle of that, the chain would be broken. So it's, it's a way uh, to establish provenance. And yes, I think that, that blockchain um, is, is a way that we can verify uh, the, the validity, the, the credibility, the, the fit for purposeness, if you will, of origin data um, and establish that that was in fact the data that was used either uh, to train a large language model or um, if I think someone earlier brought up a, a RAG system uh, and retrieval augmented generation, um, it, it's also a way to, to then verify um, that what the retrieving mechanism is going out and grabbing and pulling together to then generate that final answer is based on uh, the initial data and that there's there's provability there. So yes. Thank you. Ma'am. Uh, more questions for the doctors from UNR and for blockchains. What will each of the, I'd like each of you to tell me what are your top Three choices of tools to use for individuals uh, based on how reputable and how ethical they are and why. Question is uh, top three tools for personal use and are they reputable? And the top three from reputability and ethical use and why do you feel that way? From an ethical and reputable uh, perspective and why do you feel that way? Um, so I could go first, but I, I'm going to. Um, I reveal myself, which is that I'm not a big AI user. <laughs> um, so I do research in AI, but I like old fashioned stuff. I still take notes by hand. <laughs> um, I still make my students write essays in class. Um, so I'm not a big AI user. So I'm just gonna admit it. I've never really used any of them. Um, I like writing. Um, the one thing I do use is, um, and I don't even know what it's called. I know that there's uh, a system called like Whisper. Um, which is like speech to text and text to speech. So I use that so I can like listen to things in the car that aren't like audiobooks. Um, and I also like to dictate my writing sometimes. Um, but those are the only ones. So I don't even have three. I'm so sorry. But um, <laughs> ChatGPT is great and Copilot <clears throat> is Microsoft version of that. And so the university is really in on Microsoft. So we use Copilot at the university um, and people use it to do all kinds of things. Like it helps to automate emails and things like that. But um, I haven't gotten to the point where my email is so overwhelming that I have to automate it. So I, I just am so old fashioned. <laughs> so sorry, but yeah, so I'm sure, um, Dr. Hamza has better suggestions. I, I don't know that I could limit it to three. So I might be on the opposite end of that. Um, I was trying really hard to pick my top three. Um, so I think someone uh, yeah. in the background, yeah. I left. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I heard someone mention perplexity earlier. Um, I'm a big fan of perplexity and, and partly uh, due to some of what we're talking about that there's immediate provenance. So perplexity works very similarly to um, 
So the way that ChatGPT works, except it immediately sources where it got the information from that it uses to um, to generate the answer. So Perplexity AI is is one of my favorite. Um, Claude is a, a model that um, is produced by Anthropic, and Anthropic as a, a company actually is branched off from from OpenAI a few years ago. Um, and their uh, their mission really is is to be ethical. And so Claude is another large language model. Um, but one of the things that differentiates it is that as a really large content token window, which means that you can um, copy and paste very large articles or chapters of whole books, um, a lot of content into uh, into the box and ask it to return summaries for you. And those summaries are um, are really good. I uh, am a, a mathematician by trade and am forever uh climbing through a lot of academic white papers uh, on different mathematical proofs as they they relate to um, a lot of generative AI. And I don't always wanna sit down and read a, a, a 20 page academic white paper. So the ability to take that white paper and put it in Claude and get an output of, of a two paragraph summary is, is really helpful. Um, I also, similar to the professor, do like Whisper. Uh, so uh, Whisper is an, an open AI product that will, um, allow you to, to take any article. So I might take a lot of newspaper articles um, and that I don't have time to read. And maybe when I'm in the car, have Whisper read those back to me in, in dictation. And then because I'm a, a super nerd and code a lot of these things out myself, um, I, I take Mixtral, which is a, another large language model that I've actually um, brought down locally to, to my computer so that it doesn't have any um, external uh, internet connectivity or, or API reference so that I know that I have com complete control over um, the data that I'm giving it uh, and that that data won't leak to anywhere else and, and it's protected and, and something that I can use locally um, and tune and train um, uh, in, in whatever ways I see fit. So if I have to limit it, uh, that was four instead of three, but... Um, I think that would be my list for right now. <laughs> See, what was, the, what was the last one you mentioned? Uh, Mixtral, M-I-X-T-R-A-L. Um, so Mixtral is um, ultimately uh, a, a model that is coming out of a, a startup from France, but is backed by Microsoft as well. Uh, so Microsoft is one of their supporters. Um, and, and they also, one of the things that differentiates Mixtral because they're um, underneath new EU regulations uh, and new laws in the EU, uh, they had to be really particular about the data that they used uh, in order to train those models. So if you know, OpenAI is, is currently in a lawsuit with the New York Times because it used a lot of New York Times content uh, without prior authorization to to train GPT. Um, and, and that's something that regulators are still figuring out the, the federal level here in, in the US. Um, but because of existing laws in the U, in the EU, Mixtral had to, um, to get authorization for all of the data that they used in, in order to train their model. Um, and, and so that's uh, another reason that um, I feel good about having it downloaded locally uh, and, and being able to use it with, without that other connectivity. So that was the fourth one. Um, I occasionally use Midjourney and um, and Dolly. Uh, so Midjourney and Dolly are both image generation platforms. Um, I am not a super creative person. Uh, I'm I'm a nerdy mathematician, and so anytime I need to to put some type of visual, uh, uh, any type of drawing. Uh, even down to generating different graphs. Um, it, it would take me a long time. Uh, I use it for PowerPoints all the time at work. Um, it, it takes me less time to do the calculus behind the machine learning model than it does for me to draw all those little squares out on a PowerPoint slide. Uh, and so I will frequently use uh, Midjourney or Dolly to, um, to generate the images that, that I'm using even for PowerPoint. So those would be two additional that I could add. Any Quinn or Bezad, any tools or uh, that you use or would like to share? I think that everything that I use is, is probably primarily like 
I'm Elisa, we're at, at Watcher County, we use Microsoft, so we're using Copilot pretty frequently. And that's, I mean, one of the powers of Copilot is that it does provide uh, the, sor the source for the information. So if there is any in information that provides, it provides a link to the, the source document. Is that anything to tack on there? The same thing with me. Um, we, I use uh, ChatGPT and Copilot. Um, one advantage of Copilot over ChatGPT is that the language model first looks up the information on the website and it tries to find references to the topic on the website before it uses its own language model. So from what I understand, the Microsoft Copilot is the same as ChatGPT, except that it also utilizes the World Wide Web for as a source for information. Thank you. Any other questions here? Wayne. So uh, I'm concerned we're heading into a, a whole major political election. And the concern is about the amount of uh, disinformation and also uh, uh, fake videos. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that some of the software, or excuse me, not software, but some of the uh, Companies like Facebook and so on uh, are stating that they are going to start labeling uh, their stuff. So if there's a, a fake video, it'll actually have a label in the corner that says, this is a fake video or something to that effect. How confident are you that that's going to actually take place? And uh, you mentioned, you know, as a tool for ourselves, just being skeptical, but sometimes it's overwhelming when there's everywhere that you're looking, there's just an array of information. Uh, so the uh, you spoke earlier to the idea that the companies, even as you find a solution to how to address it, they're moving as fast as they can to try to fake out your solution, right? Uh, so how confident are you that we're going to actually be able to keep track of this stuff uh, over the course of the next nine months or whatever it is? Question, how concerned about disinformation as we go into the election and how can the good guys keep up with and combat misinformation? So that's a great question, and I would say I'm I'm decently confident that we'll be able to keep with keep up with it in the next nine months or whatever. And the reason I'm decently confident is because the companies are the ones that are creating these AI systems. They have way more horsepower, just manpower, compute power than like universities that are doing like small scale research comparatively, and so. A lot of what ends up happening like in computer science in general, but certainly in AI over the last 10 years is that AI just innovates at the company level. And then at the universities, we try to kind of come up with ethical frameworks and figure out how to, but we have such small resources in comparison with the companies. So we've really needed the companies to get on board with this kind of like ethical understanding and, and like, I guess, ethical policing of fake information. Um, because we can't, we just don't have the resources at the universities to do it. So it has become such bad press for these companies to have all this fake stuff and to be inciting all of these like bad things, basically, that they're finally on board. Um, I will say IBM has been on board from the get, um, and they're very interested in making sure that the information that gets out is is real and things like that. Like Watson was ChatGPT before ChatGPT, and it actually has verifiable information. Um, and so they're very interested in that. But to see companies like Facebook um, to actually say that they're going to be tagging videos as fake versus real, they have the resources to do that and to build a model that can do it well. Um, and so I have some confidence that they will, especially given all of the things they had to deal with after the last election with fake news and things like that. They're definitely going to try to stay ahead of it and having the resources of a company like Facebook against the resources of like OpenAI and ChatGPT and all these generative frameworks. It, they have a way better chance than we have ever had at the university level, which is typically where we've been trying to enforce some ethical boundaries, if that makes sense. So what about companies that 
aside from Facebook, what about X? Uh, Elon Musk has demonstrated a per particular political view that he has put out there as uh, I'm not going to screen this because that would violate people's First Amendment rights. Okay, and yet this is some. This is a huge company that is used by everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you catch it on something like that? Well, they did take down the so. <laughs> so, so I would say what's nice, and I don't say that there's nice things about social media because I'm not a big fan, but I will say one thing that's very nice about social media is if something shows up on one platform, it shows up on every platform. So if something shows up on X, it'll be on Facebook, it'll be on Instagram, it'll be everywhere. And if it's being checked at one point, that check will come back around. So if somebody sees something like an image or a video on Twitter and they know, and it's fake and it goes over and it's in, on Facebook and Facebook has that algorithm to say, Hey, that's fake and mark it. That will get around. So you'll be able to see where it is everywhere and identify that. So that, that in itself is a good thing. I think, um, because we're in a world where it used to be basically like, Oh, send a picture. It didn't happen. Or like take a video. And I know that it's real. And now it's like pictures and videos aren't real. So what about what just professor, I might. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I just I also wanted to add um, there are two bills, um, both of which have bipartisan support right now um, uh, on on the floor of the Senate that are looking to get passed, hopefully sometime in the next six weeks that would actually require um, videos that were were generated using AI to, to have these texts. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. And so um, do I do I think that these companies um, would would choose on their own to do a fantastic job of policing this content? Uh, maybe, um, but but I think that this legislation going into effect before um, the election season is in full swing would put these companies in a position where they would need to start labeling um, in any content um, that was election related and generated using AI uh, and, and that those things would need to be tagged ahead of time. And so that legislation is on the floor and it is something um, that, that's being discussed at the federal level that, that has strong bipartisan support because I think that that does recognize the need. Um, I think the other thing that I would say in terms of um, trying to validate whether or not content is true, um, whether that content was generated by AI or, by AI or not, is, um, is, is just remembering that, that most of the bad actors that are creating these things are always doing it to, um, to confirm a certain bias. And, and so I, I think there's always going to be some sort of, of slant one way or another on the information that's, that's being presented. And so I think any time that, that you see something like this on X or on Facebook or on Instagram, um, doing a Google search and seeing if you can find this information um, on any other site or source. Um, is, it, is it something that's on uh, a major news network? Uh, is it something that's been picked up by the Associated Press? Um, and, and I realize that that um, can feel burdensome to all of us uh, to receive information and then need to go double check uh, its its validity. Uh, but I do think that that is, is likely something that's going to need to, to continue to happen for all of us as we wanna be responsible consumers of information while we're waiting for legislation and regulation to come up um, to, to catch up with the technology. Great point. Thank you. And we're, we're about uh, 10, nine minutes left in the program. I'd like to get to two more questions really quickly. John? No, not going to cut it. <laughs> One. Uh, my name is John. I'm a protecting that children. Um, my question really uh, goes back to kids and education and data. These, these massive databases um, back 14 years ago, approximately, both the far left and the far right said we should never create these databases on children, but we did. And it's an incredible amount of data. In Washoe County, it lives in Infinite Campus. If you have kids, you know Infinite Campus. More data on kids than anything. And we're not talking about grades and test scores and attendance. And we're talking about medical. We're talking about counseling. We're talking about psychiatric. We're talking about discipline. A lot of the data entered is subjective. Counselors are entering it. 
administrators are entering it, teachers are entering it, third parties that come into the schools are entering it. We've got this massive database. Some of that infinite campus data is shared with the same database, the State Department of Education. Infinite campus is thousands of fields. And those thousands of fields, some of that has years and years of, of data in one, in one field. They neither Washington County nor the state of Nevada can tell us why they have to save this data forever. But what you said made me think about how, first of all, a lot of us have been, those of us that are paying attention have been concerned about how this is going to affect the future of our kids. Now, when you throw in AI and you throw in the fact that these entities are never going to delete the data as it is, and, and the federal government is the one that paid 49 states to create the infinite campuses that have data that is compatible amongst all the states. And one of the superintendents in this state has said the federal government has access to saying. I've never been able to prove that, but so I don't know. So the question the, is? The question is, how does, if, does AI make this better, worse, ugly? What, do you, what are you guys' thoughts on this? And how does AI affect ch children's data in education and- It's their future, about, the kids mostly. It's not their future. How does AI interface with this? Since these databases, we've told they're never going to be deleted. I I, I will try. I mean, that's a huge question. No, um, morning, really. yeah, that's a good like thirty-minute question. Um, <laughs> so, first, first of all, just just to differentiate for everybody, Washington County and Washington County School District are two different entities. So, um, I don't know anything about independent campus. But there, and what I said earlier about data governance, there should be some boundaries around how they manage that data. So for example, in our district attorney's office, we don't keep the data, the information forever. There's a retention schedule. So this is cr criminal justice information. So there's a retention schedule. We, we, we destroy it after seven years or something along those lines. So I would be surprised if there isn't some level of, of governance or schedule around that data. So and if there's not, so that's, that's a, that's a, that is a, a problem that should be addressed at the school district. We're trying, yeah. but to, and yeah. the state, and the same yeah. database also. Because <laughs> the, that, that information about children in our schools doesn't have to be there after they leave the district, right? So why keep that information? Um, as far as AI is concerned, and so that's, it's gonna be structured data, right? It's all in big old tables. Um, so potentially it could be used for uh, predictive modeling that somewhere down the line or characterizing or classifying different groups of students and how to provide better services to those students. Um, so I think it's probably really valuable data for that type of application. And I don't know if you guys have any other uh, thoughts about that. Yeah, the only thing I can think of in terms of why they say they're going to hold on to that data forever is because the data has been um, de-identified. And so they have the data in a database um, where the person's identity is nowhere in that data, but they have maybe the counseling records and so on and so forth for that person. Um, and so that's the only thing because, I mean, even at the university level, we have to apply for um, human subjects research if, we, if we're going to collect any kind of data. And we have to have a plan in place of how we're going to destroy that data when we're done with it um, and when the subjects want it destroyed or anything like that. So um, and there's never like an indefinitely thing. They're not going to sign off on that. So um, that's the only thing I can think of, because the only way they'll let us keep data indefinitely is if it is completely de-identified. And so that's what I'm imagining is happening. No, yeah. So something is really from school to university to workforce to prison. It's a number. It's it's their student ID number is how it's tracked. Okay. And some of the kids by high school they have numbers. So, I mean, and that's the I mean that's the kind of information that may be valuable. I'm surprised mm -hmm. it's not de-identified like yeah. you're saying because what are the outcomes of edu yeah. education that we can you know, what, what 
path did that person, what did one individual take or a group of individuals that resulted them ending up in prison or resulted them ending up mm -hmm. being a uh, professor? Yeah. You know, so how those are real, that's Risk really, assessment, important, yeah. really important data in terms of improving uh, outcomes mm -hmm. or improving services to uh, students. So, yeah, it just seems like there's a breakdown in protocol somewhere um, and somebody doesn't want to admit that they're wrong. Um, but that definitely shouldn't be set up like that. So. Um, one more quick question. Okay. Close on. You know how when you go to a hospital, um, there's like my charts and they can follow you from doctor to doctor. In Rosho County, will whatever setup you're setting up to get a building permit or find out information and pay your taxes, is there going to be any consistency like from one county to the next or is each county coming up with their own way to do it so that it's foreign it's like getting into a new car these days every one manufacturer has a different place for the ship not you know that there is not consistency um do the public entities worry about that at all <laughs> that it's consistent let me jump in to answer that question. Um, I agree with you that consistency is very important. And one of the things that we are doing at Washoe County is we are taking on a series of what we call is a regional project, meaning that uh, certain functions make sense for it to be consistent across the county. Uh, one example is that when it comes to building permits, inspections, and licensing, we have decided to implement a system that we use with city of Reno, City of Sparks, um, so we have and, and um, Carson. So we have um, we have looked at you know re regional implementation of systems so that there is more consistency and it makes the life of citizens a lot easier. But every county's operation is separate than other counties. So um, in my experience, most most government agencies have their own operations, their own software systems, and so forth. But again, uh, we have identified regional initiatives as a way to kind of improve our services um, to, to the region, to the citizens. Uh, we are looking at putting together a dispatching solution so that um, our um, sheriff's office dispatching process works not only for Washoe County, but also city of Sparks, city of Reno, Remza for responding to emergency management um, type of calls. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, uh, <laughs> the answer is not much consistency. <laughs> All right, so we're at the end of our evening tonight. Uh, it's a great discussion, which always leads to many more questions. Um, and could we ask each of our guest experts to give us a, a one minute or less parting thought, anything you're excited about uh, with AI or anything else you'd like to leave us with um, or where we could learn more, Dr. Hamza? Well, uh, I feel like it was a, a really good discussion. There there are a lot of things to be excited about and there are things to to be rightfully concerned about. Um I I think like like most things, um it's it's trying to find the balance between the two and, and making sure that in in our effort to um use these tools responsibly um, that we also don't limit their ability to do things effectively um, and and continue to innovate. Um, and so I appreciated uh, getting to be part of the discussion. Thank you. Bezad. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, close with uh, something that Quinn brought up. Um, one of the things that we hear often is that AI is going to replace me, AI is going to impact, to, to have an impact on the jobs and uh, the workforce. Um, in my 30 years of experience in, the, in this field, um, a lot of technologies, they have threatened uh, you know, the workforce. And um, I remember when the, 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 the cloud uh, technology became popular back several years ago, there was talks about how IT, IT departments will be eliminated or a lot of people will lose jobs. But what I have experienced is that every time there is a new technology such as AI, yes, some tedious types of manual processes and work will be eliminated, but a lot, most of majority of the jobs will be shifted somewhat. 
meaning that there, there is a shift in how we operate. So when my employees ask me that, uh, you know, will AI replace me? What I, what I tell them is that AI will not repl replace employees, but people who, who know how to use AI be better than you might replace you. So um, I, I, I guess my message is that all of us have to learn how to use AI to be more productive, more efficient. Um, if, you know, loss of jobs, loss of work is a concern. Great, thank you, Bezad. Quinn. Yeah, thanks everybody for the questions. And when we started tonight, I wasn't sure that we were going to talk too much about uh, the use of AI in local government, government, but we did. So thanks everybody for your questions. Um, I, I want to emphasize a, a few things that we talked about. Um, and one is that we're trying to utilize these tools to become more efficient so that we can provide better services. Um, we want to use the data and information that we have to make better decisions and to ultimately use fewer resources um, so that we can, and, and again, that's like being more efficient. Um, the, the other part is that, as Bezad said, you know, this AI is just a tool. So we're gonna use this tool to be, become more efficient and to provide better services to our citizens in, in the county. So I was basically just going to say that too. Um, I mean, really, it is just a tool. Uh, but I think the other takeaway really is, you know, I wouldn't be necessarily afraid of all this generative AI. Um, I would try to use it if you can to, you know, free yourself up from boring things like writing emails and whatever else. You know, one thing I have to do that I don't love is write letters of recommendation for students I just met. <laughs> Um, and so maybe I'll start using Copilot to help me do that. Um, for students that I know well, I have no problem, right? But maybe it can free us up basically of things that we don't enjoy doing. Um, but I wouldn't be so afraid of this generative AI with videos and, and, and pictures and stuff and fake news. I would just use it as an opportunity to maybe just not assume everything you read is true and maybe use it as an opportunity to kind of do a little bit of extra like Googling, like was suggested, like, can I find this on CNN or can I find this on Fox? Can I find it on one of the big news stations where hopefully it's reputable, right? So um, I think that we used to be able to kind of just consume news for what it was, but now it's a little bit of a different landscape. And so we just have to be a little bit more skeptical, but I don't think we have to be afraid. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Hand, and thank you so much to all of our experts for taking time out of your busy day to speak with us. We appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for being here. If you enjoyed this program or would like to give us any other feedback about the library, please fill out one of these cards. You can check out our website for more events and to learn more about technology. We have LinkedIn Learning. We have our free subscriptions to the New York Times and Wall Street Journal, so you can dig a little bit deeper. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Have a great evening.